So good evening. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful evening. It turned out to be very, really lovely, right? We're back into, is it spring or autumn? I don't know. I keep getting confused, but it's certainly been beautiful. So you're very welcome to our Sugarloaf campus and to this, um, our second lecture of, this, of the um, fall series. Uh, my name is uh, Sister Kathy Duffy, if you don't know me, although I know most of you, I think, by now. And I direct the, inter the um, what do I direct? <laughs> the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College, uh, our regional center that explores science and spirituality. And so what we do, we have lectures, uh, next, our next lecturer will be Bob Novak, a Christian brother from Iona College, and he'll be uh, talking about his experience and the experience of his students um, at the telescope the, trying to understand about the atmosphere of Mars. So that should be very interesting to those of you who are interested in um, astronomy. And we also have a reading circle. We're finishing a book called The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. We have lively discussions, some jokes on the side. And um, we're going to be reading John Hort's book, The New Cosmic Story, which um, you, you know, many, some of you, I think, were at uh, John Hort's talk uh, in, Oct what was it, October 8th, I think. And uh, so we're going to try to get, um, you know, further into his thinking. And uh, the other thing we have is uh, videos of past lectures, about 20 of them on our website, and uh, a list of books in our library that are on these topics of science and religion. So we invite you to join, um, if you haven't already, if you haven't already signed up for our, our um, uh, mailing list, please do that because we do send out reminders every once in a while and lists of the new talks. So this evening, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bindu Methakalam. Bindu is an assistant professor of psychology here at Chestnut Hill College. She earned her doctorate in psychology at the Pennsylvania State University. Her scholarly interests are pretty diverse, a wide range of topics, working with trauma victims, multiculturalism, immigrant experiences, acculturation, cultural identity, perfectionism, family expectations, South Asian mental health concerns, and college student mental health. So uh, we see that she, you know, has really delved into many topics, and uh, tonight she will be talking with us about dreams, which is a very interesting topic for me, and I'm sure for you too. She's published several articles and has given workshops in these areas. In her teaching and her private practice, Bindu relies on psychodynamic thought and diversity, areas that we emphasize here in our PsyD program at Chestnut Hill College. Bindu is a member of the American Psychological Association, the Asian American Psychological Association, and the Pennsylvania Psychological Association. Because of her background, experiences, and commitment to psychoanalysis and multicultural issues, she's been selected to participate in the American Psychological Association's Multicultural Concerns Committee, uh, a committee interested in increasing discussion and knowledge of psychoanalytic research and practice. And so, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Metha Kalam. Thank you, Sister Kathy Duffy, and thank you to the advisory committee for the Institute of Religion and Science for inviting me uh, tonight to be here with all of you. Um, I love this topic, dreaming, uh, gateway to the un unconscious. It's a play on Freud's words. Uh, Freud believed that it was the royal road to the unconscious. Um, I was out to dinner with a friend of mine on Saturday, and I told her about this lecture that I was doing, and, and, I, and she said, I didn't know you were into dreams. 
and this was a friend that I knew for several years, and, and, and I told her, it's very dangerous to be a psychologist and then be a psychologist who is into dreams and works with dreams because people put all these assumptions on you and try to throw dreams, which my friend proceeded to do at dinner. And she's like, what does this mean? What does that mean? And, and so hopefully, you know, I'm not going to interpret anyone's dreams tonight, but um, the goal is to keep an open mind about dreams and what dreams mean for you and the complexity of dreams and dream work. Okay. So just to give an overview of what I uh, hope to cover tonight, um, just to talk a little bit about what dreams are. So when do dreams occur? What, the, what does the research say about dreams? How do dreams differ from, let's say, nightmares? What's, um, what, is, what are the different types of dreams that we might experience? Also talking a lot about the history of dreams. Dreams are, it's not something that is new. It's not a new concept. It's something that even in our own lives, it constantly evolves and um, it's been in existence for centuries centuries, and also some of the dream theories. So what do the uh, various theorists uh, say about dreams and dream work, and how do we interpret dreams based off of these uh, various theorists? And then move into maybe some of the current research that's happening with the dream work, and then talking to you a little bit about how you can remember your dreams and how you can maybe start some dream journals in your own life. Okay. So. I wouldn't be a psychologist if I didn't ask you all about your interest and what's bringing you here today. So just what attracted you to this talk? Um, what, also what emotions might come up for you as you think about dreams? And just also thinking a little bit about, is this something you share with people? Do you openly discuss dreams? Or what, if you don't, what holds you back? So. You can answer all of those questions. You can maybe pick one, but maybe we can share a little bit about what brought you here. Um, well, partly about uh, dreams. I yeah. yeah, I think it is. OK. <laughs> um, my grandparents were Lithuanian, and they definitely believed in dreams and interpreting dreams, so I grew up you know, they would ask me what my dream was, and mm -hmm. they have a dream book, and they would tell me. And so I always thought there was a lot of power in dreams. Mm -hmm. But even now, I, um, if I'm having a difficult dream, and I wake up, and I'll just get the sense that something is off, you know, with uh, a relative or a friend or something, and I feel very compelled to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. And so I will discuss my dreams. But my husband just kind of goes, oh, another crazy Lithuanian dream. <laughs> we don't pay attention. He's going he's gonna to have a rebuttal for that. <laughs> I, as Margaret's husband, I would like to comment about that. <laughs> Margaret has the Lithuanian dreams. And I don't remember having dreams anymore than maybe once or twice a year. I wake up in the morning, I go to bed, I sleep, I wake up at 5.45, and that's it. The, the, the whole, whole rest of it is a blank. I mean, are people supposed to have dreams or not? Uh, I, I don't have any recollection of dreams at all. It, I, I mean, science tells us that people dream. I have no recollection of it. Mm -hmm. I would like answers to those if possible. Okay, yes. Thank you. I, I was going to say I have Polish dreams. We're related. <laughs> I think I have different dreams. There have been times in my life where I've had some significant dreams that had great meaning for me. Uh, but I also have dreams, and I love these, where I go to bed with something that I'm trying to work out, and I wake up the next morning. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the solution is right then and there. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm pretty sure I worked that out at night, mm -hmm. which I love. Yeah. There's actually a lot of research, and we'll talk a little bit about that, on problem solving and dreams. Hi. I always talk about dream every day. Why? I do research about the meaning of life. And I find the answer, and the answer is in the dream world. But a dream is it's not a dream at all. When we go inside the dream, we go to the first reality, and physically the second reality. And a dream is not a dream that is a story, like mm -hmm. a, a language. It is a language we're supposed to understand what does that mean. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? 
I'm one of these people who always remember all my dreams every night since I was born. Mm -hmm. And my husband is like your husband, somebody who doesn't believe dreaming really happens, except that science says so. Um, so I can never talk to him about these things, but I find them really meaningful. And lots of times they are very significant in terms of uh, symbolism. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it seems as if communication is happening from another world. Mm -hmm. and these are what I call the Irish dreams. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't know whether that's part of what you can address here yeah. tonight. Yeah. There's so many, I mean, there's themes of culture, right, within dreams, and that's so salient to us and how we understand our dreams and how we make sense of dreams. Uh, someone when asked, once asked me how I got into dreams, and I said, I think it was always a part of my life, and I was just sharing that my mom, in Indian culture, dreams are very significant, and so it was always a part of my culture and my family just talking about our dreams, and then I went, fell into psychology, and if you think about psychology, sometimes Freud comes to mind and you know Freud is uh, known for kind of just jump-starting that discussion on dreams so it's always been very relevant but there's all these cultural symbols that take place that we need to pay attention to in dreams and culture broadly speaking so not just ethnic racial background but also if you think about uh, we'll talk a little bit about SES and themes that emerge in like uh, people from various socioeconomic status uh, but also religion and dreams very in interesting Thank you. Um, I got attracted to coming because it is so rare these days to hear about lectures about dream and dream interpretation. So I wanted to see what what else is is new. Um, I've been very interested in dreams from the beginning of my career and 35 years ago. So I've been kind of studying along the way, and. Uh, and I definitely connect with feelings. I don't dream every single night, so sometimes I will have very meaningful dreams, and sometimes I'll go for two or three months without a dream. Uh, sometimes I will talk about it, um, but my wife actually talks more about her dreams and are more significant. You want to say something about it? <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Um, my wonder about dreams uh, I have had shared dreams with my sisters and you know and, and it, it happened with one sister and then with another that I talk about a dream that wasn't quite a nightmare but bothered me and then you know her mouth fell open and said I've had the same dream and then I go to my other sister and, these, and it was a pretty complicated dream and I go to the other sister you won't believe this and and then she her mouth fell open and said I've had the same dream mm -hmm. so I just wonder about those kinds of connections that we have in those worlds mm -hmm. and I've shared similar experiences with one of my brothers as well So when you think about it, do you, does it confuse you? Does it excite you, fascinate you? Kind of all of the above, maybe, sometimes? Yeah. And do you share it? Do you feel like people will hear it, will understand it? Do you feel shy about sharing it, maybe a little resistant, depending on your partner, <laughs> if your partner is open to it? Um, do you feel open that you can share it? It depends on what it's about. Mm -hmm. True, very true, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think most most of the time we we have a dream, we process it, and then we don't know what to do with it because it's so disjointed and doesn't really make sense. And there might be symbols or there might be figures and uh, representation in the dream that we don't really connect to in our lives. But the beauty of dreams is that dreams are unfiltered, right? They're unmodified. There's no, there's so much control that we have on our daily waking experiences, right? We can choose to maybe not think about the temperature in the room, but that might play out in our dreams, right? We might choose to, we see someone that we haven't seen in a while walking down the hall and we don't get to say hi to them and we compartmentalize. Right, so we do all these, we have all these functions that we perform on, in our waking lives, but then with dreams, you can't control those things. The, things, the experiences just, just flow. And that's the beauty of dreams, is that there is a emotional, cognitive, behavioral inter integration, and we're trying to understand those experiences. John Steinbeck, 
was a avid uh, dreamer and used dreams a lot. And he was one of those dreamers that used it for problem solving. And he said, people who are most afraid of their dreams convince themselves that they really don't dream at all. We know that dreams happen every night. Everybody dreams. It's just what we, how we end up processing it, if whether or not we remember the dreams. But everybody tends to dream. And dreams have been utilized by many people and have been used as a way to inspire. Okay, we know from the literature that Harriet Tubman had visions of, and she had one uh, memorable vision where she was, she was shown a, a river and then a cabin at the end of the river. And she didn't know what to make, how to make sense of that, but when she was uh, t uh, with, with four men in the Underground Railroad, she came to a river, and she re recalled her dream, and she realized that she was supposed to pass this river, which she did, and lo and behold, at the end of the river, there was a cabin, and she, got, she was able to bring these men to safe, um, safely into the cabin. And so she really relied on this dream. Mahatma Gandhi, his inspiration for the, um, the nonviolent protests against the British came from dreams. It was, an in, it was something that he was inspired by, by a dream. He had a dream of a hartal, which is hartal in um, translation is uh, strike. But people were not really moving. People were very calm, and that was one of his first des uh, decisions to think about. You know, what, how he can respond to British rule in India. Mary Shelley's inspiration for Frankenstein was through dreams, and Salvador Dali was a um, real. Uh, a fan of Freud and used to read Freud's work a lot and was inspired by his own dreams and his work. The story behind Dali is that he would have these big lunches and when you eat a lot, you, what do you feel like doing? take a nap. So he would um, purposefully have these big lunches and then he would go out into the sun and have his metal mixing bowl and his brush and lay out in the sun and sleep. And then when the second his brush fell and hit the, uh, hit the floor, he would wake up and try to remember, see if he can remember any images. And that's what he used in his work. And he was a big um, believer in dreams as well. Paul McCartney, Sir Paul McCartney also. Uh, uh, Sir Mo Paul McCartney's mom passed away when he was 14. And around 1970, when the Beatles were on the verge of breaking up, he had a dream when his mom appeared to him in the dream, and she said, let it be. And that was actually, yep, that was the uh, inspiration for the song, Let It Be. And it also, he talks about how it helped him at that time when the Beatles were breaking up, and it, it helped him to come to some sort of uh, calm and peace about that. The Rolling Stones. Keith Richards kept a uh, tape recorder by his bed, and one night he had a, a vision, and he heard the words, can't get no satisfaction, which he got up and he recorded, and then he put it, uh, after he recorded, he put it back down and went back to sleep, and when he got up, he played it, and he wrote the lyrics and wrote the music around what he recalled from the dream. And to a point where he thought, did I really dream this? Or am I taking this from somebody else? But um, that happens in dreams as well, where we feel like that deja vu. Have I been here before? And most of the time that we've been there, we've experienced those things in dreams. This is a, a, my nephew is a big fan of the Imagine Dragons, which is a band that's out now. And they had, a, uh, they had an album called Night Visions. And so Daniel Platzman, the uh, drummer for the Imagine Dragons said, I think we definitely deal with anxieties and issues just like the rest of the world. And a lot of this album, which is t entitled Night Visions, happened to be written in the late hours of the night and inspired by Wayne's insomnia or different nightmares that I had. A lot of lyrics that I write come from dreams. And so a lot of the ins there's a lot of inspiration that comes from dreams and people utilize it. Well, we tend to be also confused by it, how to make sense of it. You know, I think um, these are nice examples of how people really integrate it into their creative lives. Um, but we tend to not know what to make of our dreams most of the time. So let's just look at this. This was, um, 
you know, a dream that somebody shared with me. So an 80-year-old mother of three adult children has a dream that she is pregnant. She is confused why she is pregnant, but she needs to go to the hospital and calls her parents. Her father complains of her, uh, to her about his heart problems, and her mother says to ignore him because he's always sickly and somatic. She hangs up and gets in the car with her husband. However, it's not really her husband, she thinks. Okay? How many of us have had those dreams where we recognize someone, but they're not really the actual person? Because he looks different. Her and her husband then are at the Met Metropolitan Opera, which she's enjoying, but she's not pregnant and is in present day. Okay? So thoughts on this? <laughs> Looks familiar in some way, or thoughts people have? Is your... Well, it's, so one of the things is that uh, the mind is very uh, pliable, and, mm -hmm. and there may be confounding elements, and when we are in a sleep state, we're not really conscious, mm -hmm. uh, aware, and rational. So it sounds like there could be actually two different dreams mm -hmm. that have been combined into one. So sometimes it's important to look at when the themes are radically different and definitely not flowing within mm -hmm. each other. There may be two different dreams, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Yeah, there's, there could be multiple explanations. And, you know, because we're so complex and, you know, there is, we're more, comp, you know, more complicated in our existence that there are multiple things happening for us at any given time that we're thinking about, we're managing, we're navigating. And so, yes, there could be multiple um, issues that are present in this dream. Other thoughts? If it were my dream and I were 80 years old and pregnant, I would wonder what I was about to give birth to mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the problem we're not supposed to try to uh, figure it out what it is, because physically we would not understand it. Mm -hmm. But that is something inside of us. We must ask the question what it is. Because in, inside of you, it's like that is all the answers. Mm -hmm. Physically, it is impossible to understand it. We cannot figure it out. Right. One thing we can do is like we just assume something. Mm -hmm. The way you're supposed to do is like be connected from the inside and ask the question what it is. And the answer will give you, well, the inside of the mind or the soul will give you the answer. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's the, the difficulty with dream interpretation, right? Is that it, people want to have the answers. And so they, they look up something and they want something simplified. And, but it's more complex, right? It's, and it's very personal, depending on who the person is and depending on what they're experiencing at that point in their lives or what they have experienced or what they even are worried about experiencing, right? Um, that it's, it's very personal. And so dream interpretation is you know, you have to take it um, very skillfully, and it ha you have to be very mindful of that. What does it mean for that individual person? Um, but one of the things about this dream is that it's so disjointed, and that's what dreams are, right? We're so used to a linear process, right? If I give, t share a story, hopefully there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end to the story, right? When we, when, uh, when, when I give this lecture, there's a beginning, I gave you an overview, there's going to be a middle, and there's going to be an in summary and conclusion, right? That's how we think, and that's how we're programmed to think. But dreams shift that comfort and shift that ability to think that way, because it is, it's not, it's, it's not um, so linear. And so we end up feeling confused. We end up feeling confused and we don't, the, how we orient ourselves in, in, in a dream shifts constantly. So we are in a dream, we're not necessarily always oriented to person, place, or time, right? So when we think in psychology, we think of, we you know, try to understand how someone's oriented. Do they know where they are? Do they know who they are? Do they know what day it is, what time it is, right? That's how we tell if someone's oriented. But in dreams, all that doesn't exist because you can see that you go from present day to maybe, you know, something that existed, you know, years ago um, to something that you're thinking about maybe, you know, for the future as well. So when, when we are complicated, when we, when we feel like dreams complicate and when we want simplified ex um, explanations, we search 
we search, and especially in this generation, we, everything is on Google, right? Google it and you'll find it. So as I was preparing for this, I try to search up um, how many hits I would get on Google on just dream interpretation. So there's over six million hits on Google on just dream interpretation. Not just dreams or dream analysis, just dream interpretation. Over 300 books on Amazon that are written by all you know, various scholars and various uh, individuals who are interested in dreams. Um, tons of websites that talk about dream analysis, dream work, the, the different types of dreams. And a lot of different websites that offer very simplistic explanations. Right? So when I was in high school, I took an AP psych class and received a paper on what dream symbols and dreams mean. And I thought, none of this makes sense. None of this seems relevant to me or what I'm experiencing. But we look for when we are when we're confused or when we are um, wondering and in doubtful about what things mean, we want simple ex explanations. And dreams cannot necessarily be so simple. So the cartoon over here says, uh, it's two dogs. I had that dream again. I was chasing a rabbit through the field. What do you think it means? Um, and so we're, you know, some dreams might be very simplistic and it's easy for us to uh, understand what it means and other dreams are a little bit more complicated. Um, there was a dream, one of the examples that one of my uh, former supervisors gave was um, they were, she was working with a client who was um, work, you know, talking about seeing a post office and there was no real relevance to the post office in her life. No one ever worked in a post office. She felt all her mail was on time. You know, she, there was nothing that she was worried about. But so they, they thought, let's forget about the dream. Let's, uh, let's maybe talk about some of the other things that are happening in your life right now that can help explain this dream. And one of the things that she was worried about was her husband's retirement. So what he was going to do post his retirement from the office, okay? And so it didn't, you know, if she was looking for a simplistic explanation, somebody would have said, go, you know, maybe there's something about the mail or post office or the, you, there's some connection there and, and it was a little bit more complex than that. And it, it required several sessions and several um, attempts to really think about what this means before they actually understood what it meant for her. And she was really, you know, anxious and worried about what what would that would look like because she was wondering, well, what's he going to do with himself, and is he going to get depressed, and all these things that she was um, kind of keeping to herself. Okay, so what are dreams? Dreams are a series of images, ideas, thoughts, emotions, and sensations occurring in the mind during sleep, okay? So what we know from dream, the past dream research is that we, he we heard that dreams only take place in REM sleep. But we know currently that dreams take place in, in REM and non-REM sleep. So uh, every given night for a full, if you get like seven or eight hours of sleep, you hit REM four or five times, and you should have about four or five dreams that you can accur accurately recall. Because what we know from the research is that if you wake up immediately after a REM sleep, you're more likely to recall the details of a dream versus non-REM sleep dreams. They're less vivid. You're not able to recall those dreams in detail. How about when you're just first going to sleep? Is that, that We're some um, lucid dreams. Yes. Yeah, lucid dreams are a hybrid of non-REM and REM sleep. So the lucid dreams are the dreams when you know you're dreaming. You can control those dreams a little bit and either you can play around in those dreams and control it a little bit more before you hit REM and you're not in control um, or you wake up from those dreams, right? So absolutely, and depending on what the dream is, you decide. Right? Um, my mom passed away in March, and I had a dream, interestingly, my sister and I had a dream the same night of our mom, and I was talking to her. This is, she was, she was battling cancer for three years, but this was mom before cancer. And so I was talking to my mom, and in my, in my dream, I can tell this is a dream. That I'm talking to mom, she's happy, she's, you know, she's laughing, and, but then, and I controlled it. I was, I was definitely not going to let her go in that dream. So I stayed in the dream, but then I don't remember what happened afterwards because I ended up going into REM. Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, 60 to, so 60 to 90 percent of people who are awakened right after REM could remember their dreams. Um, and then what we know from the research and from um, brain waves is that there are several parts of the brain that's active <coughs> during sleep. So the amygdala, you know, with emotions, hippocampus, memories. So even uh, st uh, moving from short-term to long-term memories, right, all of those are active. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the theories of dream and that's, uh, that uses the brain and what, what the brain is doing to help us to understand and process dreams. We're also very aware of sensations, what's going on around us. So if you hear noises, it's incorporated sometimes in your dreams, right? I always, early in the morning when my alarm goes off, somehow I have dreams of the, the, some alarm going off in my dream as well, right? You're also aware of temperature. So if it's particularly hot or if it's particularly cold uh, where you're sleeping, that can engage in your dream. Uh, whether you're struggling to stay warm or you're in a very um, hot climate in your, in your dream, all of that is infused in dreams. Paul and Van de Castle, is, they're one of the um, pr um, earlier researchers for dreams, and they talked about themes in, in dreams, and they found that most dreams have a negative theme. You know, that some dreams tend to be positive, but more, most dreams tend to be negative, and there's a focus on disappointments and worry, where, uh, rather than maybe more positive, optimistic dreams. Okay, lucid dreaming is what we were just talking about. It's the hybrid dream that occurs. And, um, and then nightmares. Nightmares are distressing sleep experiences that wake someone up from their sleep. And this is something very important to remember because nightmares of, where we see nightmares a lot is with um, individuals who are struggling with trauma. And we see it a lot studied with PTSD um, and, and the nightmares that pe uh, people who are experiencing PTSD exper um, go, uh, encounter. What we know about nightmares, especially nightmares around trauma, is that people are very, very vividly and accurately remember the traumatic event. There's often just a small piece of data that's, that's shifted. But the actual traumatic event is it's very detailed because it has, it has been ingrained in the person's mind. Um, it's part of their safety. In order, to, in order to work through the trauma, in order to be, feel safe, they have to relive the event in some, in some capacity. And so in nightmares, people are able to actually go back to the, um, the actual event, okay? Uh, people, for, so 3% of civilian populations experience uh, nightmares uh, and versus 52% of uh, combat veterans. Uh, civilian population without trauma are, are usually experience nightmares once a year. Children experience nightmares more and we know that children, um, usually after the age between 20, 10 and 13, children experience a lot more nightmares and then it goes down and then they start to experience nightmares about once a year, similar to adults. Okay, difference between, some of the questions people ask is what's the difference between a nightmare and a bad dream? We've had those ex uh, experiences as well. We wake up and it's just a distressing, uncomfortable dream. It's, the, it's on the continuum, right? So if you see nightmares as the extreme, the emotional really takes a toll on us, and then the bad, the bad uh, dreams as more of, it's, it's distressing, but it's not something that we might necessarily think about or perseverate over uh, throughout the day. And then just a quick thing about sleep terrors and sleepwalking, just because dreams involve sleep. Um, sleep terrors and sleepwalking, really, there's no dream involved in sleep terrors and um, sleepwalking. And people who experience sleep terrors, which is usually children, um, and, and sleepwalking as well, mostly children experience that, um, they're not able to recall that they were sleepwalking, or they are not able to recall. With the sleep terrors, they wake up with a piercing scream, but they're really not awake, and they're still in that dream state, but they can't recall that that happened to them. I just want to read a excerpt from uh, Deirdre Barrett is a faculty member at Harvard University, and she does a lot. She's one of the prominent researchers on dreams. And she, in her 2003 work, she uh, looked at work on PTSD, P uh, post-traumatic nightmares, working with trauma victims in Kuwait after the Iraqi invasion. And so she was, just to give you a sense of what a PTSD dream looks like. 
One dreamer had a brother fighting in the resistance. She heard that he had killed Iraqi soldiers by sniper fire. She had the following recurring nightmare. We are at home, and the Iraqis come to the house. They break the windows and storm in, searching everywhere and demand to know where he is, the brother. My two little children are crying. One soldier is pointing a gun at each of our heads, one by one, saying he will shoot us if we do not tell where he is hiding. But we don't know. The soldier pulls the trigger and shoots my son, then my daughter. I wake up screaming. In real life, they did come to the house, almost like this, did hold the gun to everyone's head while they asked about my brother. But they never shot anyone. They finally left. And her brother has never come home. Um, they think they found, she thinks that they found him and shot him. Um, her mom believes that he's a POW. And so this, you can tell the similarity. It's a very similar, very vivid, very detailed experience with just one, one piece of the dream that's missing. And that's often the, the case in PTSD nightmares. Okay. So just quickly, some factors that affect sleep and, and will affect REM and um, non-REM REM sleep. Definitely PTSD. Um, and stress and trauma effect impacts um, sleep and you might more actively dream when you're under stress. Uh, loss and grief when there, are, um, when there are changes and transitions, all of that impacts dreams and we might find that we dream, end up dreaming more when we are under stress or when we've experienced a loss um, or dreams might not necessarily make as much sense. And then alcohol suppresses dreams. So we, uh, when um, individuals are um, abusing alcohol, when they're intoxicated, they don't necessarily hit REM and uh, dream as, as often. Okay. So some of the history of dreams. Okay. So we know this is not a new concept. People have dreamed way before we all have dreamed. Um, and probably one of the first books that were that documented dreams was the Chester Beatty, Beatty uh, Papyrus. Okay. And this documented dreams. Um, this was in Egypt in 2000 uh, BC, and they had a list of good dreams and bad dreams. Okay, and good dreams were seen as something that was spiritual, and there was it had some sort of divine intervention, and then there were bad dreams that were seen as more demonic, okay, um, or you know some sort of violent, something that was predicting violence. So commute. So in um, in our history, we know that dreams were seen as some communication from a spiritual being, from a higher being, okay? And that there were specific individuals who were chosen to interpret dreams, okay? So these individuals were called masters of secret things, okay? Scholars, there were priests who you would go to in order to get your dream interpreted, to understand what that meant. Uh, Babylonians were dependent on dreams because it was uh, seen as uh, to predict, you know, seen to, uh, for, uh, as a way to foretell and to see what uh, they needed to do in order to prepare for the future. And that's how in Judaic and Islamic faith, dreams are seen as a way to predict, as a way to prepare. And probably one of the um, more famous ways to predict and prepare is Joseph. We were just talking about Joseph. Um, and Joseph was known for his dream interpretation. And, and so just even in the Old Testament, there's 98 specific references to dreams. So dreams were highly salient um, in, um, in, in, in the history. Okay. It, there is also uh, Muhammad um, was known after morning prayers that in, uh, dreams are so sacred that you had to pray, you had to prepare, and after morning prayers he would ask his followers about their dreams and then spend time interpreting <laughs> dreams you know, with them. Um, the Egyptians and Greeks were the first to see dreams as a way of healing. Okay, so the Greeks are always ahead with medicine and, you know, uh, healing. And they used to have uh, something called sleep sanctuaries or, you know, incubation, where you would um, purify yourself 
if you had a um, physical ailment or um, you had you need you were in need of healing, and you would ask the the spiritual leader if you know to bring you to the sleep sanctuary, and you would sleep and you would prepare for a dream. You would ask to see a dream to help you with the healing process. And sometimes you might see an animal. Sometimes you might see uh, a figure that points to a certain body part. And that might be the body part that would need more healing. You might feel, you know, there might have been two or three different ailments, but that was the body part that you would have to focus on. And people would spend days in these sleep sanctuaries, so you would not leave until you got the answer for your dreams. Okay? And then Heraclitus was the first writer to actually connect that the, it, the dreams are not just personal, but it was sacred as well. Okay, so dreams often represent the personal and the sacred, that there was something more than what we can explain that was happening in dreams. That was not just about what our existence, but something that was beyond our existence. Okay, and then Carl Jung and William James believed that there were spiritual and religious explanations for dreams. And Jung, I love this quote. Um, it says, who looks outside dreams, but who looks inside awakens. So really thinking about what happens inside and the spiritual and the personal meaning for dreams and how that can help you grow and self-actualize in your life. Okay. So importance of dreams and culture. So we talked about this. There were themes that were coming up about culture and dreams, okay? In certain Arabic um, traditions, dreams that were um, traumatic in nature often represented something positive, a positive outcome. So death might mean power and success or something that, you know, birth, you know, something positive. Or losing a limb might mean wealth. You know, so there were often these um, contradictions of what you saw in the dream. Um, in Indian culture, it's the same. I think when Sister Kathy Duffy and I were talking about dreams, when we first started talking about dreams, you know, we, I told her when you see a baby in Indian, some Indian cultures, it's actually not a good sign. Um, that means that there is, you know, maybe death or some, you know, ending of life that's coming, um, and so no one ever wants to see the actual baby. So hope that's when you hope you're loose, having some lucid dream and you can control the dream. Um, and then in Navajo, uh, bad dreams mean that you have to do something. So for example, to undo the dream. So for example, losing a tooth might mean death, and so you would have to make an offering to undo that dream and the significance of that dream. Okay, um, in some indigenous groups in South America, the spirit of ancestors appear to a pregnant woman and that's the sign of when she can announce the pregnancy because it's the ancestors who have given permission, who have allowed for that this is something that you know can be announced. Um, in, in many um, African cultures, five generations of ancestors can appear in dreams and this is so remarkable because sometimes we see people that we don't know who are in our dreams. And um, in many African cultures, it means that it, they're part of your, they're part of your your family, they're part of the lineage in some way. So it doesn't mean that they're strangers, they're part of the the, the, the culture, the group, the family, and the, uh, the collective uh, community. Um, in some um, areas in Ch um, cultures in China, dreaming of the sun or the moon rising means prosperity for the family. And so we see the importance of dreams in many uh, of, of the cultures um, throughout the world. And this is something that we need to take into consideration when we're doing dream interpretation and dream work because we want to understand how does each person understand dreams within their cultural framework. Um, I had a client from Kenya once that she had a dream after her father died. A month after her father died, she saw him and she saw some other men sitting at the foot of her bed and her father told her you know she he was she she grew up very very privileged um, in many ways and her father said you can't you have to do things for other people you can't just keep this to yourself and so you have to take care of the less fortunate and you have to take care of people who are in need and she took that as that was a message from her father, and she became, that was a part of her social justice justice mission, because this was something that was coming from her father, and how she made sense of these other men, or that these were men that she might not have known that preceded dad, that were part of the family. 
Okay. So some perspectives on dreams. So we start always with Freud. Um, love him or hate him, Freud um, started, you know, people talking about dreams, right, and what it me uh, means for individuals. And uh, uh, his biggest work on dreams is the interpretation of dreams, which came out in 1900, where he talked about unconscious wishes, unconscious desires, and that was what the what signified dreams. Okay, so for Freud, it was actually if you dreamed of something, let's say, you were chopping off the head of a chicken, I don't know, <laughs> thinking of something violent, um, that that means that there were some aggressive impulses that you were, you were trying to contain and you were trying to repress, okay? And so Freud talks about manifest content and latent content. So the manifest content is the actual content, it's the actual details of the dream. So me chopping off the head of a chicken would be the actual content of the dream. The latent content is the symbolic What's, what does it mean? What does that represent for you? What are you trying to um, not show the rest of the world? Okay? And for Freud, dreams were a way that if you, if you acted it out in a dream, that was appropriate. Because it's better to act it out in the dream than to act it out in, in, the, in society with other individuals. Okay, so he talked about repressed desires and wish fulfillment and that these things come from what he coined day residue. Okay, so things that you were experiencing, desires and um, feelings that you might have been repressing during the day that's going to come out in the dream. Okay. All right. Jung, also a friend of Freud's, okay, believed that instead of concealing and repressing, his, his uh, belief on dreams that was that it revealed, that it revealed aspects of the waking self, and it really taught us about things that we need to uh, be, uh, be attentive to, okay? So he talked about the amplification. And amplification means that in some dreams, and you can think about your dreams, certain figures might be prominent. There might be, your leg might be bigger than the other leg, you know, or um, there's a person that is really prominent. And that's what you need to pay attention to because that means that's revealing something. Your unconscious is revealing that that's a very important person. Whether positive or negative in your life, that that's something or there's, you might be worried about another, that limb. You know, that when there's something that's amplified in the dream, that it's, the dream is trying to reveal itself and to tell, talk to you about what is important. Okay, and so he, his, his work was on the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. And he said to, you have to move beyond the personal and think also about the collective. And how we understand this now is thinking about not just our personal identities, but the society we live in. So the collective unconscious talks about the blueprints, the archetypes, what we've taken in from society and what we understand as a whole, right? So in academia, we think about, if you think about collective unconscious, the things that we might think about is research, teaching, scholarly work, right? That's a part of the collective unconscious of a, someone who's in academia, someone who's learning, someone who's educating. And that all gets incorporated into your personal unconscious, and that's how you understand dreams. He also talks about colors and shapes. He was one of the first to talk about textures, and all of that is symbolic and uh, needs to be understood, and you need to think about why are certain colors appearing in your dream? Why are the shapes of th um, things um, uh, you know, in your dreams? So he'll ask you things, uh, questions if you were working with him on um, what impact will the dream have? Why did I have this dream? How will it shape my future? Because he saw it as a way to help the individual understand a little bit more. He also thought that it was very compensatory. So one of Jung's dreams was that he was working with a female cl uh, client and was not developing the relationship. He just, something was happening. He, was, he didn't like her, she didn't like him, and it was really making the work very difficult. And he went home um, that, after a session with her, went to sleep and had a dream that he was looking up at a woman in a castle and he couldn't reach her. And when he woke up from the dream, he had a crick in his neck. 
And so he's feeling, once again, feeling, and you know, those um, textures and emotions are very salient for Jung. And, and so he thought, if I'm looking up at her in my dream, I must be looking down on her in some way in real life. And he realized there were parts of her that he didn't like and he didn't approve of. And so he shared this dream with her and she said, yeah, she did feel that he was in understanding her. And that changed their relationship remarkably. So he utilized his dreams in his clinical work. Okay, so I'm gonna have you do an exercise. Okay, on dreams. Okay, I want you to think of a dream. Think of a dream that you can share with somebody next to you. Okay, because you're going to work in pairs. Okay, write down and write down and think of as many details that you can think of about the dream. Where you were, what you know, who's in the dream. Think about maybe colors, textures, anything that you can recall. All right, and then share it with your partner. Okay, what's it like to, you know, first I want you to think about what's it like to share this dream with someone else, but also think about are there aspects of the dream that you feel that represent you, positively or negatively, whether you want to think about it or not. Okay, so maybe we can take a few minutes and do that. All right, so first, what was that like to talk about it with maybe people you know, some new faces that you might not have known? What was it like to actually talk and share parts of your dream? I love it. You love it. <laughs> Say more, Sister Kathy. <laughs> um, I, I shared a dream that I had a couple years ago uh, at retreat. And I am always helped by talking to somebody. So, you know, at retreat I have a director, a spiritual director, who I can share it with. And the, the amazing thing to me is I don't usually see the, you know, what's going on. But a good question really helps, you know, like, um, well, in, in this case, it was, what, it, what is your birthday? And it, that was very significant, and I wasn't even looking at that particular thing. And that person did not know that that was significant. Mm. But just the fact that it appears, as you said with, you know, the, the dreams, you know, the post office, I thought that was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. uh, and the dream uh, ego seems to play with those kinds of images, and mm -hmm. I get the biggest kick out of it, you mm -hmm. know, when I can see. Mm -hmm. Who else? Other experiences, talk, just talking about your dreams. I thought it was interesting that nobody at our table actually wrote anything down because we all started immediately talking and sharing. Yeah. <laughs> And in a way, we all had similar dreams, and it's it's nice that people can feel open enough to to share this because mm -hmm. I think a lot of our dreams have to do with insecurities that we're trying to work out through our dreams. Mm -hmm. But we did like one by one, quite openly share all of our dreams, and nobody was afraid to do that. And um, and and we didn't really write anything down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it speaks to really the excitement and the eagerness to share and talk more about dreams. Okay. What, what else? Anything else? Who else? Oh, okay. I'm here basically because a friend of mine claims to dream a couple times every night and remember them. You don't remember I'm not certain I never dream, but I certainly don't remember much. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple a year. What's the basis of your apparent contention that we all dream, it's only a member of re recollection. Mm -hmm. Is that a co common question that people had? Yeah, there's, I think there's like a number of different theories that explain uh, difficulty recalling dreams. Um, one is that if we don't really remember, if we're w we wake up and we start the day with different thoughts that come through our mind, we don't remember our dreams. We start off with stress or we start off with some sort of anxiety. It's harder to recall those dreams. Um, if we don't wake up and really think about those dreams that we had, even, even laying in the same place, 
not just getting up and jolting ourselves and starting the day. When we jolt, our mind starts to, our brain already starts to function and starts to think about the things that we need to do for that day. Um, the other theory that researchers have talked about is um, differences in norepinephrine and serotonin levels in remembering dreams, because that's a part of what researchers have used to like uh, understand why some people remember it a little bit more, and different levels that people have um, that might contribute to dream recollection. Um, but we all have it, and you know, researchers have studied that this is something that people all experience, but we, some people will remember it more or less. And you know, Freud would talk about, if you think about different theories, we're, it's our mind protecting, once again, concealing. Did we not want to think about those dreams? Um, several uh, it, researchers who integrate spirituality and dreams will talk about the dream will come to you when you're ready to remember that dream. And so there are a variety of different theories that, are, that explain why some people remember and why don't, some people don't. Just, yeah. Did you want to, were there, you had asked? No, no, no. Mm-hmm. Another factor is that I think a lot of people shortchange their dreams with some, some exceptions. Yeah. Some people may dream six hours and be able to remember their dreams mm-hmm. because that's the way they're, they're built. Absolutely. But some people may shortchange their sleep yeah. and they may normally need eight hours, but they yeah. push themselves to sleep only six. Yes. So they, and they have very stressful lives. So they yes. usually have to, don't give themselves time right. for the brain to enter that. Right. And I find that people, for example, during the weekends, mm-hmm. when they have a longer sleep time, they mm-hmm. will be able to remember better dreams during the weekend when they have a longer night time than during the week when they've right. shortchanged themselves. Right. Yeah, and that kind of correlates with the stress you. and you know, and time we have to sleep and time do we have to um, give to dreams. But it also, it's one, it brings a good point, it brings up a good point about the, um, the, the struggle with doing dream research is that most of the time you get participants who are interested in dream and who are open to th- those dreams. And what researchers are trying to do is we you know, m- want to look at individuals who are open to dreams and who can recall, but also um, individuals who might not be able to recall or you know, who um, struggle with you know, that, you know, that openness with dreams as well. Yeah. Okay. I have to get by. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Uh, I think there are a lot of cultures uh, where uh, there is a very active sense uh, of dreams as uh, pathways for ancestral visitations. Uh, mm-hmm. In the African American community, this is this is a very big force. Uh, Native American. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm pr- I'm pretty much a product of Western culture. It's not so much part of part of my awareness, but mm-hmm. I don't I don't sell it short. Mm-hmm. Uh, could you, uh, you know, perhaps uh, speak to that a bit? Mm-hmm. You know, visitations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, kind of going back to um, thinking about collectivism, right, and that dreams represent um, learning from the community. Right, and learning from the group that you might be a part of, and that the community is there to provide you with information. So a lot of these cultures that you are referring to are very collectivistic and group-oriented in nature. And so there is a desire to learn from not just the people who are present in that person's life right then, but ancestors and individuals who are, you know, who are part of that person's collective unconscious, so to speak. Um, So I think that's definitely a part of that um, visitations and the importance of ancestors. Go ahead, Cheryl. I just wanted to add, I was sharing at the table um, the story that you shared about the the lucid dream that Mm -hmm. you and your sister had about your mom. Mm -hmm. Um, I would call that a visit from her mother, Mm -hmm. uh, letting her and her sister know uh, that she was okay. Um, And so Mm -hmm. when you said that, I I just wanted to add that. And so every time I dream about my mother, it's a visit from my Mm -hmm. mother. And it's Mm -hmm. very beautiful and very comforting. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have to believe that that's her visiting me that makes it tolerable Mm -hmm. that she's no longer here. 
So, but I think that that, that is cultural. It might even be uh, associated with religion and spirituality, mm -hmm. which you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah, the funny thing is, right before my mom died, um, we told, we asked her, we said, Mom, give us a sign that you got there okay. Wherever you're supposed to get, and, you know, tell us you got there okay. And, you know, she wasn't responding at that time, um, but we knew she could hear us. And so, as it's funny, I just thought about this as I was preparing for this talk that my sister and I had a dream about her that same night. And I told my sister, I was like, do you think, you know, I'm doing, doing this talk on dreams, I wonder if that was mom's way of saying, hey, I got there, because we both saw her, my sister saw her running in um, and, you know, doing something that she loved and she was happy, and my vision of my mom was she was talking and chatting, and that's my mom. She talks and she chats, and she's very happy. And, I, and so it was, yeah, we thought, is that, is that her way of telling us? she's okay, and she got there. So yeah, absolutely. But you, you know, I think that, you know, in many cultures, there is this, um, you know, especially I think, you know, collectivistic groups, there's this understanding of people, you carry people with you, right? So um, we, we tell our students, you carry the voices of your supervisors, even five years, you know, prior with you, because you will, you will sit with a client and, and, or you'll sit with someone and something a supervisor or a teacher said will jolt your memory and you'll start to talk about that. And so I think that's very salient in many, many cultural groups. What, what about, oh, go ahead, sorry. So um, earlier in, in your talk, mm -hmm. Um, you use the term vision mm -hmm. and dream mm -hmm. quite freely, interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I have been giving some thought to mm -hmm. because I have both mm -hmm. and I like to think I know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, how do you differentiate it? Yeah, I think in earlier in the literature, uh, when we under, especially if we understand it, if dreams as something that was spiritual in nature, and so people correlate that with visions. And so um, depending on the, the type of work that you're reading, dreams and visions, visions appear in dreams as a sign, as something um, as present for you to respond to or that's important in your life. So it has been used interchangeably, but there are definitely, there. I think there are differences that we're seeing in, in the research now. But I think especially when we look at earlier um, works and using spirituality and understanding spirituality in dreams and the importance and of um, a higher power providing a vision um, or a path or opening enlightenment, I think that it has been used interchangeably. Yeah. How do you understand it? You said you see it very differently. So for me, a vision is very clear mm -hmm. and oftentimes they're repeated. Mm -hmm. And those are dreams where I can feel mm -hmm. and touch and mm -hmm. smell. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't leave me. Mm -hmm. The visions I've had in my mm -hmm. adult life, mm -hmm. even though they were 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, they are as clear to me as today as when I had them. Mm -hmm. They are visions. Mm -hmm. I have dreams mm -hmm. of puppies running around. Those are just dreams. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be, I guess it uh, depends on the individual, yeah. Yeah. but I like to think there is a different value mm -hmm. in the types of dreams that we have mm -hmm. uh, and when we need visions mm -hmm. and how much of weight some of us put in those dreams slash visions. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to be able to separate the two mm -hmm. because some of us, like me, I live by my visions. Mm -hmm. I've gone to far and wide to search for my visions because I find them to be my calling, mm -hmm. the purpose in life. Mm -hmm. I married a gentleman because of my dream 30 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Clearly it was the right dream. So, and I knew when my children were coming mm -hmm. and all these things had come to me in my vision. And I don't necessarily incorporate them mm -hmm. in the same light as the dreams I have sure. on more routine basis. Sure. Yeah, and I think you bring up an excellent point that it's important to emphasize it depends on the individual. It really does depend on the individual. And that's why simplistic interpretations are not sufficient. Okay? But, um, but I think there are several people who would have 
rep rep repetitive dreams of of something of something about a calling that they're uh, they're supposed to do that there's an expectation and so for for some individuals that comes in a dream and that's why I think it has been used interchangeably um, and so for uh, for others it comes in other ways right there are people that come into our lives that that teach us or tell us what we you know where we you know where the path that we're supposed to take. Uh, you were talking earlier about nightmare, but you didn't explain the reason why. My question to you is, uh, why do you have nightmare, and how do you get rid of it? Nightmares come from some, a stressful event. Um, how do you get rid of it? Is to address the stress, the stressor um, in in your life, right? Something that's stress, something that's causing discomfort, um, and so it's important to address that. And I, I think that that's what um, individuals who work with clients who have nightmares is to understand, once again, similar to the dream, what does it mean? What is the stress? What's the context of those nightmares? And then how, um, how do we address that stress to reduce that? Do you have a follow-up? You mean children have nightmare and they have no problem. Uh, they have no problem. So why children have nightmare? Children often have nightmares True. about children, right? We mean children are nightmare about something that they're scared and they don't understand yeah. why. Yeah, children have a very active imagination and they're often very scared, especially at night. Um, there is a theorist, by the um, a behavioral theorist, Albert Ellis, that talks about how we um, stay with negative thoughts. And children are very active and very uh, known to stay with negative thoughts. A child doesn't go into a bed um, and about to go to sleep and say there's a monster under the bed. No, they end up then saying there's a monster under the bed, the monster has ten heads, it has like five arms, right? And so they really have this active imagination. And so they are scared. That is a stress that they're experiencing. And so what we, you do with um, what a caregiver does is to say, well, no, let's look under the bed. Right? Let, you're addressing that stress. Let's look under the bed. I, we don't see uh, the monster with the ten heads. Or what can we do? Can we put a night light in um, in your room to uh, so you you don't um, or leave the door cracked open so you can come into our, my room um, if you're scared? Right? And so they do. They do have a lot of stress and anxiety, especially at night. Their minds are really unfiltered at night. Yeah, but when I was five or six years old, I was always dreaming a little girl who always bothering me. Mm -hmm. And she was scaring me like crazy. And once I started to go older, I was fed up to dream always the little girl. Mm -hmm. And what I found out with time, once I did to do research, she was my daughter uh, 3,000 years before. And I was in love with your mother, and the mother was, uh, went to the bad side. And she said to this uh, daughter, I abandon her. And when I said to her in my dream, uh, you were my daughter, I was, uh, I can't follow her, her mother because she went to the bad side. Mm -hmm. uh, although I would never have her. So mm -hmm. what the uh, little girl uh, told me, she gave me her name, her mm -hmm. age, and she never came back. Mm -hmm. that, you said it was years later. Yes, yeah. and she never came back, and she came back one time to say hi to me, yeah, and she never came back. I think that's an excellent example. We, you know, we talk about, and we have to understand the individuality of dreams, right? And so the purpose is not to say this is how you understand dreams, and this is the only way you understand dreams. There are multiple explanations and multiple perspectives that we need to take into consideration when we understand dreams. And so um, I don't know. And I'm comfortable saying that. I don't know what that means, and you know, but I, I will be, um, you know, insensitive or you know, fraud to say I know, and this is what it means, without knowing any more detail or any more context about that. I think one of the things we always have to bear in mind is the the context of the person and who and what the dream means for that individual. Okay. Are there? Are there? Use the microphone. Okay. Um, are there certain uh, those symbols, uh, certain events in a dream that you kind of link with a life event? Mm -hmm. um, is is there you know a certain list? Mm -hmm. It's like oh, like I was I had a dream about floating in a floating mm -hmm. or in a circle in mm -hmm. the water, mm -hmm. and I didn't know anything, but I I was mm -hmm. at a retreat and my. Re um, 
person that I was working with said, oh, well, that means you're moving toward a change. Mm -hmm. it, it could, or it could be, it could right. mean. It could be. It could be. Right? I think that I stay, steer but away that's from... That's only a little part of, of the dream. I'm right. Saying. Yeah, I steer away from symbols and lists because it really then says, well, this is your experience and this is what this means. Okay. Um, I think really going back to that Jungian example of, um, you know, not being able to connect and also that post office example, right? There, if we say that there are specific symbols, we are negating further further exploration, right? And really looking at the context. So um, I move away from specific so, symbols and lists. So you don't use that in your practice at all? No. You just I say, oh, you had a dream. Tell me what it was about. What do you think it meant? Right, and basically. always keeping it at, on open. Uh -huh. So just because you had the dream doesn't mean that we don't discuss it anymore, mm -hmm. um, that we have to revisit it. Right? We have to do this little dance with it. At some point, it might make a little bit more sense. Parts of it might make more sense, given where a person is. And then we, it's our job to figure it out as so the work unfolds. So I guess that's where the journal comes, is handy, because right. you can go back and revisit it. Yeah, Thank so you. that's really important. So let me ask you about going back to the exercise a little bit. Are there, when you talked about dreams, were there parts of the dreams that, that you talked about that you connected with that meant that this was something that you were experiencing in your life or parts of your personality? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Were there parts that you didn't connect with or was harder to connect with or you didn't understand? No? Anybody? Everybody connected with their dreams? You're all so self-actualized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what the exercise I had you do was a gestalt exercise. So gestalt and Fritz Perls, Fritz Perls the founder of gestalt psychotherapy, and gestalt meaning form or whole, okay, talks about the integration of the dream and that each aspect of the dream represents the, the dreamer in some way, good or bad. Okay, and there, when I asked you, are there parts that you didn't connect with, that those are the parts that we don't really want to see of, of ourselves, or those are the parts that we necessarily haven't understood yet about ourselves. And so for, for Fritz Perls and Gestalt uh, psychotherapists, they talk a lot about integration and awareness as being whole. So part of the awareness is talking about it. So being able to share your dream and talking about your dream. So the table over there that said you were excited, you didn't even get to write anything down, that is what the Gestalt therapist would say. You have to be able to talk about the dream. You have to be able to share it because that's what brings awareness and that's what puts significance to the dream. And then you have to play out the parts. So what Fritz Perls would often do is, um, in one of his writings, he talked about uh, work with a client and she had a dream of a license plate and the license plate was drowning in the water. And so he just took several sessions just to focus on that license plate. And he said, what do you think the license plate feels? What do you think the license plate is experiencing? And so she talked about the license plate is just floating away. No one cares about the license plate. Uh, no one, it's, it's insignificant. It's an insignificant part. People don't care about it. It's not as important as the other parts of the car, right? And so just, just that one piece, just that one item in the dream, he really fleshed out. And that represented parts of her that she was feeling like she, she was neglected or people were not caring about her in certain situations. And so really he talks about the integration and awareness and that is salient in, in dream interpretation and meaning. Some of the more modern perspectives of dream, Al, um, Hobson and McCarley um, in 1973 talk about the activation synthesis hypothesis. And so this brings more of the biology behind dreams. So what this is saying is that when you sleep, that we know from research that the brain is still active. Okay? And so the pons in the brain stem is firing images and signals that you have recalled throughout the day, maybe throughout the week, just you have in your life. And then it, they fire it to the, um, the cerebral cortex, okay? And the cerebral cortex is trying to synthesize and make sense of these dreams. And that's why dreams seem a little disjointed, because they're random. 
So you might have dreams of puppies. You might have dreams of running. Um, you might have dreams of attending a lecture. Because these are all things that are somehow been in your mind. And then your dream, your, the, the cerebral cortex is making, trying to make sense of it. OK? Domhoff is another uh, researcher um, that's, doing, uh, that's talked about the continuity hypothesis. Okay, and what Domhoff means is that dreams were representative of the person's waking life, their cognitions, their emotions that they are aware of, that you're already aware of during the day that you may or may not paid attention to or given salience to during the day. Okay, so dream content correlates with the emotional salience in waking life. So, for example, if you dream of um, your one sibling more than the other sibling, that there might be more, you might like that one sibling more, or you might have conflict with that one sibling more than the other sibling. That there is, there is something that you're reacting to, that, that you're responding to, that's, that's continuing in your dreams, okay? Um, and you know, he, he said that, that dreams, give him a thousand dreams for one person, and he can, he can, um, probably tell you more about you and who you are, and it's more accurate than your fingerprints, or almost as accurate as your fingerprints. Um, and so he did this study, and this was, I'm gonna read this to you. Um, he talks about dreams being the psychological portrait. And so he did this study, and this is from Kelly Bulkley, who's another researcher um, out in California, his article in Pastoral Psychology. And so they look at a, they look at a client, um, and they call the client Mary. Okay, and what they do is they don't know, they try not to understand anything about the, cl uh, the client or the individual. They don't want any background information. They collect the dreams, okay? And so for this individual, they collected dreams between 1999 and 2000. So over 300 dreams that this individual recorded. And then they try to make predictors, hypotheses about what might be salient in this individual's life. And then they meet with the, with the dreamer and they try to do some more work on understanding and doing a more of a thorough, comprehensive intake about what's salient for this individual. Okay, so Mary recorded 316 dreams, okay? One, she had a dream um, where God was mentioned six times in, the dream, in, um, in dreams, okay? Four involved hatred and aggression toward God, and four dreams involved singing, so 21 out of her dreams also uh, made reference to Christmas and Jesus Christ, okay? And there were, some, there were noteworthy dreams that involved a deep-seated hatred toward religious tradition, okay? Um, she also had a dream about her sister and her sister breathing, okay? Um, and she, the, another noteworthy dream that she had was that um, her mother was holding a little girl's face over boiling water because she did not believe in Jesus, okay? So from these dreams that they were collecting, they made some hypotheses, okay? One was that Mary was neither an active follower nor was she atheistic. She was feeling some sort of ambivalence about dreams, about uh, religion. She had a Christian upbringing. They were making this hypothesis based off of her um, references to Jesus Christ, Christmas in the dreams, but they didn't know which denom you know, specific denomination. She, they felt that she no longer belongs to that faith, okay? Um, and there were clearly negative feelings toward faith and spirituality, but spirituality is important to her. There was also a strong connection to sister, and there was conflict with mom. Okay, um, and because music was a part of the dreams as well, music was so important to her. When they met with her, she was a musician, she was an artist, um, and sh her sister had died about three years prior to this exercise. And um, her sister was on a ventilator and so had difficulty breathing, but also that um, the sister's death pr pr uh, proved to be a real spiritual crisis. So if we think about the word spiritual and to breathe, right, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of dreams and themes about breath and the sister losing the breath. So the sister dying was significant because it brought about this, this spiritual crisis for her, 
Okay, but she also found that because she was in the spiritual crisis, that who she was turning to within the faith was not supporting her. And so she found no solace, which was what caused that conflict. And she found that her mother was found a lot of comfort in the religion, but she didn't, and she felt lost. And so she was having this very conflictual relationship with mom as well. Um, she says she was brought, brought up Southern Baptist, and, but she didn't practice it. But she was looking for something. She was, she was trying to understand. She said that she wanted to um, come understand spirituality and find, a, and find some sort of meaning. And that was her work. But just based off of the dreams that she provided, they were able to make some hypotheses and have her flesh it out. And it was very, I think, um, you know, accurate. You know, with what she was experiencing and, you know, the conflict that she was experiencing and how she ended up fleshing it out. So it really can give you a profile of who this person is. And that's what the continuity hypothesis and Domhoff's and his colleagues look at. Okay? So we talk about dream research and how dreams are studied. And there's a lot of struggle in studying dreams because you're, you're getting participants and getting participants who are open to sharing their dreams. Uh, the best way to look at dreams is at a sleep lab, okay, where dreams, where you're in a, con you know, the sleep can be controlled, where you can be wake wake awakened and you can write your dreams. Um, the other way is to journal. We talk a lot about, people have talked about keeping dream journals. So many dream researchers will say to keep a journal or keep a, you know, we think about Keith Richards recording um, his song, you know, to keep something um, by your bed to recall your dreams and to remember your dreams. And then psychotherapy, incorporating all of that and maybe um, talking with your you know, psychotherapist about dreams and the salience and the importance of dreams. Okay, so somebody mentioned problem solving. Yeah, so this is a big research, area of research in, um, you know, with dreams. And this started, you know, one of the pr uh, most prominent researchers is Dement in uh, 1974, looked at 500 undergraduate students Okay, and he gave them brain teasers. Okay, he gave them brain teasers to, um, to, to solve right before they went to bed. Okay, and he said, focus on these brain teasers and, and tell yourself you're going to see it in your dreams and you might, if you don't have the solution, you will find the solution in your dream. Okay, and so what he found was that 87 of these 500 individuals had a dream about the brain teaser. Okay, seven students actually solved. They found the solution in their dream and they were able to report back. And then there were several who, so the, 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 the solution was water. And there were several individuals in the dream, this is so fascinating, who had dreams about scuba diving, snorkeling, all these things that involved water, but they, they, they dismissed it. They're like, I don't know, that doesn't really make sense, and you know, I don't know what to make, make of that. And, and then afterwards, when they found out that the solution was water, they, they told him, They're like, this is, what's, this is what we ended up dreaming about, okay? And then Deirdre Barrett, who I mentioned before, um, talk, looked at about 76 subjects in her, in her class, and she told them to think of a personal problem. So not something that's so complex, but something that um, is less distress, causes you know, much less distress. So some of the, her participants um, were worried about, I think one of the participants were uh, thinking about which clinical psychology program to choose. Okay, you always choose Chestnut Hill College. <laughs> um, but which clin clinical psychology program to choose? Okay, um, this one or that one? Um, one of the uh, dreams was where to move furniture that might fit you know, both you and your roommate's um, style, okay? So simple, maybe a little bit more, less complex problems, okay? And so what she did, which was kind of a play off of Dement, was she asked the clients to incubate. And this was from like, you know, like those, like the earlier times of sleep incubation, where you spend about 15 minutes thinking about the problem Okay, and then telling yourself, getting yourself into a relaxed state and telling yourself that you will dream of the problem and you will find a solution. 
and really believing in that and, and uh, getting yourself into a more of a mindful state, eventually leading to sleep. Okay, and what she found was about half of the stu uh, students dreamt, dreamt of the, the problem, should I said uh, dreamt of the problem, and 76% found that they, uh, they had their solution after, after the dream. Now what they would suggest is that you incubate a dream for about a week. Right, so if, even if you don't um, find the solution on the first night, that you incubate and you keep, you um, just, you do this process over a week and within the week, you should be able to find the solution. Okay, and so I mentioned John Steinbeck early, earlier, and so John Steinbeck, believer in dreams and solutions, and said, he has a quote, it is a common experience that a problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it. Okay, the brain. Um, and so that, that saying, just sleep on it. Right? Uh, really, you know, just thinking about the problem and how you know, the dreams can help you with finding the solutions. And then there's some research, there's a lot of research now that's being done on, on grief and, and, um, and dreams, okay? So Barrett as well looked at um, about 245 people at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. 77 people had dreams of someone that they've lost, okay? And out of those uh, 77, she was looking at themes that occur, okay? So about 39% had back to life dreams, that the person came back and is linked to them. And what she found was that this was associated with the earlier stages of grief, Okay, when there's, there might be some denial, um, um, and so the person is often, they are awakened with shock because they're in disbelief that this person is gone, um, and how can this person come back to life? Um, another 39% um, had daily activity dreams, so where they're having dreams, and once again, moving uh, down the stages of um, uh, grief, where they are accepting a little bit more. Okay, and they're seeing the person in their natural habitat, doing things that they really loved and they really enjoyed. Um, and then 23% had advice or comfort or gift dreams. Um, I think the dream with my mom was a gift dream, um, that she was sending us a message, and she sent me and my sister both the message on the same day. I think that's very powerful. Um, and, but also advice. You know, if we think about going back to like that committee on sleep, that dreams, people come to you in dreams as a way to tell you things, prepare, maybe prepare you for things, or when you're struggling. Those people never leave you. Um, they leave you physically, but their spirit is always with you. Um, and then other types of dreams that in, uh, were included in the st study is the saying goodbye dreams. You know, so what would, you know, people, you know, people have talked about um, having a chance to say goodbye to a loved one and having the chance and having that opportunity to finally say goodbye. Um, also taking a journey dream, and these are some very powerful dreams where the dreamer is walking with the, with the loved one and, um, and at some point the loved one leaves and the loved one says goodbye and they part ways on their journey. Um, and then there's the young again and well again dreams um, and seeing that person and how you remember that person. And this is how you remember the person and you want to remember that person and that's what's incorporated in your dreams. There's also a lot of dreams that are coming. This is a budding area of research um, that looks at dreams and culture. Okay, so looking at gender, um, males, um, and this has been consistent, I think, over uh, several years of research, where males are more likely to have dreams about other ma uh, males, um, which is different from women, where women there are, um, they tend to dream about both men and women equally, um, and women, uh, men also have more dreams that are located on an outside setting where women have more dreams um, located where they're it may, maybe familiar settings. And um, also women have tend to report more nightmares than men, okay? And so one of the, one of the um, critiques of the literature and the research is are women more likely to report nightmares than maybe men? You know, is there some vulnerability in reporting that um, than men? Um, also looking at SES, people um, who are, um, of, you know, from like a lower SES, rep, uh, see more people in their dreams, right? And they're in, they're dealing with more people uh, than individual socioeconomic status, yeah, um, versus upper class. And if you think about 
the, the cultural implications for that, there are. There are more people maybe having, you know, to, you have to deal with and less power or control, um, you know, given, you know, given SES. And then ethnicity, there was a study done on, um, that was uh, by Prasad and colleagues uh, that looked at um, Indian Americans versus uh, Caucasians, and Indians were more likely to be in family settings versus Caucasian individuals. And then, um, and Caucasians were more likely to be outdoors um, and Caucasians were more likely to dream of strangers than compared to the dream reports that, um, that Indians uh, shared um, in the dream research. Let's do a, a show of hands. Who thinks A, failing, fall, failing a test, most common dream? One, two, three, four, five, six. Jeremy, is that a hand up? Okay. <laughs> okay. So about six. How about B, nude in public? Okay, keep your hands up. One, two, just two? Somebody had their hand up? Okay. C, falling or flying? Ooh, that's a lot for this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay. And then D, being chased. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Nine. All right. So the answer is falling or flying. Okay, that's been recorded in numerous studies as one of the more common dreams. And they're lumped together because people often talk about falling and falling, you know, if you fall and you end up falling, could that represent death? Um, but there's a lot, of a lot of times when people interpret their dreams or they share their dreams, they're actually flying and floating. So somebody talked about floating. Um, and that's a very common dream that people have. The second is being chased. Okay. Uh, third is being paralyzed. So if you've ever had dreams that you are not able to maybe move, right? That's a very common dream. Um, four is being late for an event. So class, those dreams that you're late for class and the class has already started or the uh, exam has already started. That's a, actually a very common dream that people have. And then five is sickness or dying. Um, whether it's you or whether it's a, uh, a loved one. And then six is failing a test. So all those dreams that students have, that it was anxiety dreams, very, yeah, very common. They're not, you know, abnormal in any way or deviant. Um, and then um, seven is nudity in public, okay? Um, so these are common dreams that uh, people have had, okay? So I talked about incubation right, and like ways to remember your dream, so we, and to help solve a problem. But if you wanted to remember your dream, some, you know, what the research says is to one, you know, be open to the dream, that you will dream, and uh, to be open to maybe receiving um, some, something at night, okay, experiences at night. Two is to get yourself in a relaxed state and tell yourself that you will dream. Okay? Part of that incubation process, the work that Deirdre Barrett does at Harvard, is to get people into a relaxed state. Because when we are um, stressed and when we feel like we're not going to, we're less likely to remember those, those dreams. Okay? Three is to keep a notebook okay, or something, a piece of paper by your, by your side. Okay, so you can remember the dream. So if you think about those REM sleep dreams are the dreams that we're more likely to remember. Okay, and so if we wake up and not, and, the, and researchers will say don't wake up and jolt yourself up, right? Stay in that state, stay in that um, laying down, relaxed state, and then write down what you remember. Everything that you can remember about the dream. Because what happens is that when we wake up, then we start you know, adding more information that things are gonna happen to, uh, during the day, things that have already happened, things that we need to get done, um, all of that then starts to cloud and filter um, our dreams. And don't pressure yourself to remember the dream, okay? Just, you know, once again, very important to be in a relaxed state, be open, and whatever comes to you, comes to you. And then, when, oh, like I said, don't, try not to get uh, distracted. Because I think when you bring in other stimuli that's happening after you wake up, you're more likely to forget the dream. Okay? So just to summarize, you know, so the meaning of the dream is personal. We talked a lot about that. Um, it's personal for the individual, okay? You must know sociocultural context. So we talk, you know, there's a theme of culture and like, you know, cultural significance to, you know, for each person. Um, 
And, but it's really important to understand that it's useful for each individual. It's gonna mean something different for given what, where somebody is in their time in their life. Um, at Chestnut Hill College, we talk about a holistic education. And so it's really important to talk, you know, think about the dream from a holistic perspective. Right, to really look at um, the multi uh, systems and layers that may be involved in the dream, okay? Um, and then be open to learning about yourself. You know, it can give you some data. You know, it's not the be all end all. The, day, the dream is not the only thing you should be following, but it should be giving you some, some piece of advice that can be incorporated um, along with other things in your life, okay? So, Wish you sweet dreams and a very restful night. Um, there's always a tendency when people talk about dreams that you end up dreaming. So hopefully you will all dream tonight. And the things that we talk about end up being incorporated in your dream. So if you have that happen, it shouldn't be a surprise. Thank you. Thank you, Bindu. That was uh, very interesting. No? Yes. yes. <laughs> so we, we really appreciate it. Um, all of you, it was very, um, uh, very complete, really. A, a great history of, of dreaming and um, different aspects. So we really appreciate it. So I hope you do have a, a good night, good dreams, and uh, drive safely. All right, be sure to come back again. If you haven't signed up on the mailing list, do that, and we'll be in touch. Our next uh, is November 14th, so please come back next week. <laughs>